Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'll be covering the disappearance of Rihanna Moshweshwe. Rihanna Wena Moshweshwe was reported as a missing person in February 2010 when she never made it back home after reportedly meeting up with a friend. It's been over 10 years that she went missing and she still has not been found. Before I dive deep into this case, I would like to give out my usual disclaimer. I mean no disrespect to the people I am going to be talking about. This is just information I found online and compiled into a video for educational purposes and for people to be aware of these cases. Rihanna Gwena Mushweshu was born on the 15th of August 1994 to her parents Stanley Mushweshu and Paul Mushweshu and is the last born of two children. She was born in a township called Kalashiwe in Kimberley in the Northern Cape. Her parents divorced when she was young, which resulted in her living with her mother whilst her brother moved with their dad. She was a learner at Kimberley Girls High School at the time she disappeared. Rihanna is described as being her mother's baby, her parents' pride and joy. She was spoiled a lot and she was deeply loved by her mother and they got along so well. Her dad was a bit strict, but other than that, he was fair and very loving towards her. In Aira, her best friend describes her as being a happy soul. She said that she's the type of person who would cry with you if she saw you crying. She also said her friend was very trusting, which is a trait that unfortunately got her into a sticky situation. About a month prior to her disappearance on the 23rd of January 2010, Rihanna and her friend Kine Rimodawong were walking around the neighborhood when a black BMW drove past them. Soon as it went by, it reversed back to them. And honestly, a black beautiful BMW, the latest at the time, just drove past them and stopped you know in front of them so obviously they they were admiring the car the car stopped next to them and inside were two males the man in the passenger seat greeted the two girls and introduced himself as tabo whilst the other said he was robert tabo then proceeds to ask rihanna for her cell phone numbers she doesn't decline this and gives them to him he then tests whether Rihanna gave him the right numbers by calling her then and there and that is how she got his numbers. He then asked Rihanna if he can call her later and she agrees. After giving him her numbers, Tabo and Robert drive off and Rihanna and Ginelwe continue to their original destination. Around 5pm that day, Tabo called Rihanna and said they, Robert and him, were in Green Street West end suburb and asked if they could meet up however rihanna brushed it off and it was left hanging he called her again between 8 and 9 pm that evening rihanna reported this to ganelwe and suggested that they go out with tabo however ganelwe refused and said and i quote we are not going there rihanna's brother was also there and he too opposed of the meeting so rihanna's father took the three home and that's how the night ended. So the weeks went by and Rihanna does not mention Tabo to Ginelu again. That was until the 20th of February 2010, a day before her disappearance. Rihanna and Ginelu had spent most of that Saturday at church and later in the afternoon they were just at home watching TV, chatting and just relaxing. All the hours that the two spent together, Rihanna never mentioned Tabo that was until later on in the evening when they were both at their respective homes. Rihanna had texted Ginelu on Mixit, or rather asked her to guess who would be taking her shopping the following day. When Ginelu guesses the wrong answer, Rihanna corrects her by telling her it's Tabo. Tabo was apparently going to take Rihanna shopping for a Lyra concert that was going to take place on the 27th of February 2010. So the following weekend, Ginelo was obviously shocked about this and asked her when was this going to happen and why Tabo was wanting to buy her clothes. Rihanna replies by saying it's going to happen tomorrow, so on the 21st. And she also mentioned that um, Tabo was going to take her to identity and was going to spend 800 rand on the clothes. 
Rihanna then proceeds to ask Nelwe if she wanted to tag along and obviously Kenelo says yes but she asked Rihanna to move the shopping spree to the following Friday because on the 21st uh, Kenelo was going to be a bit busy and Rihanna agreed or at least seemed to agree so they continued chatting until the two fell asleep. The following morning 21st of February 2010 Rihanna was woken up by a call at 7.47 and she finally gets out of bed at around 8 a.m. She went to bath and in between that her phone was ringing non-stop. Between 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. she gets out the house and her mother was watering the lawn. She stands by the door frame and tells her mother that she'll be back soon. As a concerned mother, her mother asks her where she's going. Rihanna replies by saying that she's going to meet up with Genelwe in town. Her mother continues to ask, you know, what they were going to do in town. And Rihanna replies by saying that someone had deposited money for her in Genelwe's bank account. However, she doesn't reveal who this someone is and why they had deposited money for her in Genelwe's bank account. After some convincing, Rihanna's mother finally says, yes, she can go. And asked her not to come back late because she needed to go to a funeral and Rihanna needed to come back home so that she can cook and she also asked her to buy electricity on her way back so she gave her a hundred rand and she also gave her the electricity card she took all those things and went out the gate and that was the last time she was seen by her family at around 1pm Mrs. Mosheshwe leaves her house to go to her aunt's funeral and Rihanna was still not back at the time she left. She returned around 5 p.m. and Rihanna was still not today and she had assumed that she was at Ginelo's house because that's what they usually did you know go to each other's houses. So she left to her aunt's place again around 6 p.m. She finally comes back home at 9 p.m. and she finds the house in complete darkness. Now she's very concerned, so she decides to call Rihanna, but her phone was off. She then calls Ginelwe and her, f her phone was off too. Not knowing what to do at this point, she decides to sit on the couch and wait for Rihanna to come back home or for her to at least call her. She waits and waits and she finally falls asleep sitting on the couch. She wakes up at 4 a.m. the following morning and Rihanna was still not at home. Mrs. Moshesha then decides to call Rihanna's dad, you know, asking them if Rihanna had slept over. However, they said no. And that is when the whole family became concerned and they started to search for her. They called her friends, they called her other family and they called the police. Now Rihanna and her mother were using contract phones and they were both registered in Mrs. Mushweshwe's name. So on the 22nd of February, Mrs. Mushweshwe went to South Sea, told them the situation and asked for Rihanna's phone statement or at least the last number that called her before her phone was turned off. Once they got the numbers, Mr. Mushweshwe, Rihanna's dad, decides to call this number using a public phone. When they first call this person, the person picks up and Mr. Mushweshwe asks, who he's talking to. The man on the other side identifies himself as Franz. When Mr. Mushesha asks if he knows Rihanna, the man drops the call. He tried to call him again, but it went straight to voicemail. And the voicemail said something along the lines of, I'm Franz Oliphant, please leave your name and numbers, etc, etc. So, Tabo had actually lied. His actual name was Franz Oliphant, 38 year old at the time, Franz Oliphant. So he had used the name of Tabo to lure Rihanna and Kinelwe in. Out of desperation, Mrs. Moshweshwe decides to call the number using her own cell phone. Now take note that prior to her disappearance, Kinelwe and her mother had swapped phones because Kinelwe lacked her mother's phone more than hers so they swapped mrs moshesha calls the number and she realizes that johanna had saved the number as stalker with two exclamation marks 
On the 26th of February 2010, 38 year old Franz Oliphant was arrested in connection with Rihanna's disappearance. Circumstantial evidence led to his arrest in Lichtenberg, where he was working for a furniture removal company. In between the time he got arrested and his bail hearing, Rihanna's parents had tried to go visit him in jail in efforts to find out where Rihanna was. Franz was reportedly rude to them. He didn't greet them, nor did he want to shake their hands. And he straight up told them that if they were there for their daughter's case, he had nothing to say to them and asked to be taken back to his cell. On the 27th of February 2010, six days later, Rihanna's phone and the electricity card were handed over to her parents by Itumileng Boisen after finding them on the 21st of February discarded in an open field and this information was taken to the police. An integrated task team comprising of the Hawks, Kakhesha, detectives and the Kimli K9 search and rescue unit launched a full-scale investigation and an intensive search for her. Guys, they went through everything. Switch pipes, drainage systems, they searched high and low, near or far, in areas surrounding the places she was not seen and they they came back with nothing. During the investigation, it came to light that Tabo, whose actual name was Franz Oliphant, had a few charges to his name that included assault, rape and arson. He had tried to burn down the home of one of his ex-girlfriends and also tried to kill her in the process. There were also incidents of theft whilst he was employed at the furniture removal company. As I said before, his case was based on circumstantial evidence that was brought forward against him. His ex-girlfriend speaking out and laying charges against him. And all the witnesses that spoke against him played a huge role in the conviction of this man. On the 1st of February 2011, his trial commenced in the Northern Cape High Court in Kimberley and Judge Franz Homo presided over the trial. This trial started on the 1st and was concluded on the 28th of February 2011 and his sentencing was delivered somewhere between the 3rd of May and the 10th of May the same year. So initially Oliphant had 11 charges against him and the 11th being murder. However, this charge was withdrawn. Mrs. Mushweshwe wanted the court to speak of her daughter in the present tense. She believed and still has hope that her daughter is alive, while Rihanna's dad wanted to be more realistic and said that, and I quote, I believe that Rihanna is no more. So because, so because of this reasoning and surely many others, this charge was withdrawn. So counts one to seven were related to one of his ex-girlfriends who during this trial went as Miss D. She was also from Khalashiwe and was born on the 1st of October 1986. So Miss D and Franz Oliphant had met around February or March 2006. Um, Miss D was 20 at the time and Franz was 34. He had asked her for her numbers multiple times and all those times Miss D said no. She finally gave in and gave him her numbers. They started chatting and the encounter turned into a love relationship and eventually it went sexual. Miss D claims that they had had their first sexual encounter late 2007 at a place called Franz Farm next to Putin Nang suburb and that their relationship ended in February 2009. Counts 1 to 5 assault common, rape and assault GBH are alleged to have taken place between this period whilst count 6 and 7 arson and attempted murder relate to offences which are said to have occurred on the 14th of November 2009. On the 10th of May 2011, Franz Oliphant was found guilty of 8 out of 10 charges and was sentenced to 36 years imprisonment in the Northern Cape High Court. Charges 1, 5, 6 and 8 were run concurrently, meaning that he will not get any parole. 
and he will probably only get out of jail when he is 74 years old. The search for Rihanna Moshwejwa has now become a national issue and not confined to the Northern Cape. The task team involved in her case has vowed not to rest until her whereabouts or fate are revealed to are revealed so that her family can get closure. A DNA profile was compiled by the police for her and they will continue to follow up on any information received. Years went by with no new leads to this case that was until a promising lead came through in 2019. A YouTube video started circulating on social media of a young homeless woman in Pretoria talking about her life on the streets. Social media users could not overlook as to how similar this woman looks to Rihanna. And guys, honestly, the, the resemblance is mind-blowing. Now, personally, I have never been good at looking at people's facial similarities and differences. I'm going to find this guys, but I see it, you know, her lips, her eyes. The woman has braces and so did Rihanna when she disappeared. I also watched a video of her mother talking about the similarities between the two and the way she passionately spoke about these similarities, you know. She said she wanted to remain neutral about this and didn't want to get her hopes up, but the way she spoke so passionately about it, it honestly broke my heart. Uh, so after this came to light, this woman was tracked down and was asked to meet with Rihanna's family and she did. She was also asked if she could supply um, some DNA and she complied because she wanted to help the family get the answers they desperately needed. So the DNA sample was taken from the woman and unfortunately it, it wasn't Rihanna. Um, it was not a match. However, she was taken to rehab and she got the much needed professional assistance because she was addicted to drugs and was homeless. So every year in efforts of highlighting the fight against child and woman trafficking and violence against women and children, an annual Rihanna Moshwetre soccer tournament is held in the province. Her mother has been fighting tirelessly for her for the past 10 years. I'm sure it has not been easy, especially when others are saying one thing and you're just holding on to this hope that your baby is out there. It's probably taken a toll, not just on her, but her whole family in so many ways. You know, as, as a mother, when you bring your baby into this world, you never imagine that someone would snatch them away from you at just 15. This is not the future or fate a parent imagines for their kids and I honestly cannot imagine what they are going through. I believe that the power of our combined efforts can lead us to where Rihanna is and bring her family the closure that they deserve. It may be 10 years later, but we are not giving up on her. We cannot and we will not rest until she is found. If any of you watching this right now knows anything about where Rihanna could be, or has any information on what could have possibly happened to her, I will leave numbers you can call in the description box. Also guys, take note that all information brought forward is handled confidentially and can be, and can be given anonymously should you wish to protect your identity. Please do not sit on information that can bring her and her family justice, you know, like do the right thing. So that is it for this case. You know, I keep on wanting happier endings, but I've just come to realize, you know, that is not going to be the case for everyone. But yeah, I will see you guys on my next video.